Holy Christ. Well, they all sleep and live. It's like a 15th century slave. That's what it's like. Every inch of this boat is used for either fish or people. And the passengers are all like this, two and a half feet high. As you've already seen, this thing is a floating slum, and it's packed. The vessel itself is only about 140 feet long. But in that space, they pack a crew of 30 and 330-odd fishermen. Of the 330 fishermen, about 70% of them are children under the age of 14, some as young as six or seven. Why do they use the kids? Well, they use the kids, one, it's very cheap. OK, two, they're small. They can pack them in on the boat. Uh, their families more or less farm them out. It's just an ongoing way to keep, uh, keep money coming into the family. What does a kid get paid? Oh, they'd be lucky if they get a buck a day. What happens is that their family can draw that off. And so the boys end up after, um, say, 10 months at sea, fully at sea, never going ashore, coming back and owing money. And so what normally happens is they have to sign up for another, uh, another 10 months. Do any of the children ever try to escape? Oh, yeah, all the time. Uh, you go by the different islands, and you know how the kids have the blonde hair? From okay. the sun bleach. From the sun bleach. You know, like, Any time that a blonde haired kid is found, they immediately take them back down to Oslo, and they get a reward. And the kids have been known to, as they go past the islands, to jump off and uh, they're trying to swim ashore. And jumping off is exactly what the children do for a living. When a likely fishing ground has been located, the boys hurl themselves by the hundreds off the big mothership which is running full tilt, underway. Risking air embolisms, sinus compression, eardrum damage, and oxygen starvation blackout, the young divers, holding huge weights, plummet to depths of 80 and 90 feet on a single breath hold. Their first job, to secure fishing nets to the reef. On the surface, 250 boys swim shoulder to shoulder and begin a method of fishing that seems most like African bush beating. Each boy carries a long line reaching all the way to the bottom. The line is segmented every few feet by a streamer of white plastic. At the end of that line is a heavy steel ball. It's called a scare line, and its purpose is to pound the weights on the reefs below. The sound and fury of the weights bashing the reef panics the fish and herds them into the waiting nets. It's extremely effective, but it's also completely indiscriminate, taking every fish that swims, cleaning out a reef area, and so destroying the food chain. Everything from the small bait fish to the largest predator. The boys, incidentally, have the job of removing the frightened, angry shark from the net. Before the net can be lifted, divers must again plunge to the bottom, this time to get underneath the huge net and free it so it doesn't tear on the coral. At this point, as many as 20 boys can be under the net, totally cut off from direct escape to the surface. Their only exit, through a single hole in the center of the net. So they wait patiently in line to pass through in single file. Their amazing breath hold ability allows them to stay at great depths for more than three minutes, longer than this entire underwater film sequence. I was more than humbled when I approached with my heavy scuba gear to shake their hands. This method of fishing was adapted from the Japanese, who, after overfishing the reefs in their own country, used Philippine slave labor during their military occupation of these islands during World War II. <laughs> Removing the kids from the water is as perilous as putting them in. Still under power, the mothership cuts through a sea of children. It's the boy's job to scramble up ropes thrown to them as the vessel steams past. 45 minutes after jumping in, they come out cold and tired, and they will repeat the operation 10 times a day for 10 months at about 10 cents a dive. Well, only yesterday there were two drownings, yesterday drowning accidents. Dr. Pepito is the company doctor, the only doctor responsible for the thousands of boys in this region. What are some of the diseases that you see frequently in the children, in the divers? I will start with typhoid fever because that's the most uh, problematic case here when we get typhoid fever. Uh, number two, we have amoebic dysentery and then the lower respiratory tract.
That's bronchitis and pneumonia. What about ruptured eardrum? Well, uh, usually the divers get that. Most of the divers here now have ruptured eardrums. When they come and they need medical care, do they have any kind of insurance or do they pay for their medicine themselves? Is that right. deducted from their meager salary? Yes, that's deducted from their meager salary. Dr. Pepito's office is located on the remote island of Talampuhan, base camp for the 30 to 40 Muruami boats working the Sulu Sea. This is where the vessels offload fish and take on water and firewood before setting back out to sea. The ships only return to their home ports for critical repairs, and then usually just once each year. Unable to bear that separation, some parents relocate here from home islands hundreds of miles away. They come for the occasional chance to be close and to pray for their children's safe return. Here, even the Madonna wears the dive gear of the Muruami. Reporting a story like this one generates certain emotion. Granted, these are tough times in the Philippines, and many of the fishermen consider themselves lucky to have any work at all. At their base camp, many told me their chief happened to be making one of his rare inspection tours of the island. As night's cover allowed visions of paradise to return, my anger at him brewed. The next day, we tried to confront the big boss of the Muruami. But scarcely glancing up from their game, his stoic bodyguards muttered only that he had quietly left the island in the hours before dawn. I wish we had had the chance to meet. I would have liked to ask Mr. Abina some questions, like how he can rape the reefs and condemn children to a life of peril, with no chance of advancement, no room for ambition, with no hope of avoiding a dead end. What about education? Well, you don't have any free education. It's just pure survival now. So they'll be fishermen and they'll die fishermen. Yeah, most of them. According to Dr. Pepito, lack of clean water and sanitation had resulted in an epidemic of dysentery. It killed 50 children on Talampuhan this fishing season alone. Following a tiny coffin and the latest of the many funeral processions, we found the graveyard of the Muruami. Crowded around the windward point of this tiny island, the handmade grave markers identify the youngsters not by their full names, but by the fishing group they worked with and ultimately died for. And on top of their graves are piled all their worldly possessions. Can you believe that in this day and age this still happens? The Muruami, the child slaves of the Sulu Sea. No. If I hadn't seen it, I would not believe that in this day and age, this kind of thing still happens. What on earth could be done about it? Well, I think that the Philippines is an ally of the United States. We have to exert some kind of moral influence. We give them hundreds of millions of dollars. We must say that this is simply intolerable. Won't they say you're, you're, uh, this is a domestic issue? Too damn bad. Uh, Too damn bad. Are you optimistic that this is going to happen? Well, I, I just think that at some point, morality has to take precedence over geopolitical considerations. I think we have to show them that the Americans just don't stand for that. And having been to the Philippines myself, the contrast between the rich and the poor is, is absolutely shocking. But this poor, this scene, I never expected. These are the original dead-end kids. Thank <laughs> you.